Hello, viewers, and welcome back to Kokomimi's AI presidential D&D campaign. We hope you all enjoyed the winter holidays and welcome you into this new year. Now, it is Barack's turn to give the recap. In the last main episode of the campaign, we finally learn Merrick's backstory, leading up to his journeying on this adventure. Merrick is the son of a gentle med noble of Arbridge named Chadwick Purbit, who sometimes moonlights as a bard. His mother is a wood elf ranger named Mary Vineweather, who originates from a village in the Feywild. Mary was exiled from her home village, mostly because of Merrick's interest in magic, which is seen as an affront to the values of her home community. In order to prove his worth to the village, Merrick and his family endeavored to impress the elders of the community, but failed. Now, he is inspired to take a leading role in restoring the balance of nature and understanding what this means in the world. In the current timeline, our party, Merrick, Benjen, and Donna, arrived at the Arakokra village outpost situated near the Cliff Temple. We met Qual, the leader of the outpost, and assisted him in clearing out some harpies that had taken up residence near the new maple syrup farm. Now, I believe we are opening the story with the final dungeon map of the campaign in the Cliffside Temple. That's right. Thank you very much for that recap. We had a short episode right after the main episode, which consisted of a gift exchange. Be sure that each of you have adjusted your character sheets to reflect these changes. Merrick, you were gifted a raven by Donna and a sending stone by Benjen. You asked the comments to provide name suggestions for the raven. Have you decided on one? A lot of good suggestions, but my favorite was Poe, so that's what I've settled on. He can ride on my shoulders while we adventure. Oh, I like Beaky. Poe is a bit more... refined. A good choice for an animal that will be the familiar of a wizard. What about Beaky Poe? You could always shorten it like BP. Mr. Gasoline, oil reserves. Bringing some democracy to find that oil. Fitting. No, his name is Poe. How about Poe Beaky? Then his initials would be PB. I like BP better. Of course you do, Donald. PB? Peanut butter, perfect. I love it. No, you two are steamrolling my moment with your stupid tangents. His name is Poe. The end. Fine, but I'll be making oil-related jokes anytime we talk about him. Not naming him BP for shorthand is a mistake you will regret. I like peanut butter. God almighty. I've decided to allow the Raven to have limited speech. They are very intelligent animals, after all. All of you will be able to talk to the Raven to some degree, but I'll allow Marek to have more complex conversations with the Raven given that it is his familiar. In turn, the raven can respond in limited speech. Now, Donna, why don't I talk about your newest golden apparel? Oh, hell yes. Good. Okay. Donna received a pair of golden bracers from Merrick, which will add two points to her armor class as long as she isn't wearing any armor. She also received a sending stone from Ben Jen. You should tell it like it is, Ben. The sending stone is from you because Joe forgot his character's name is Benjen and didn't know he had drawn himself in the gift exchange. He messed everything up. Well, things worked out in the end. Benjen received a sending stone of his own and I received a lovely new Christmas sweater. There's something else I wanted to bring up. We sort of forgot about it, which, well, we'll talk about that in a bit. But you all purchased some fairy jars at the carnival in Saltwish, but never did anything with them. Holy shit, I forgot about those. Indeed. Donna, you were able to purchase a lower elemental jar all for yourself. Merrick and Benjen pooled their resources and purchased a bottled fairy. Both can offer a blessing to your character if open, including possibly permanent stat buffs. However, while the fairy can offer better blessings, you may also find yourself tricked with mischief. What do you all want to do? Do you want to open the jars or leave them for later? Given that you have forgotten about them, it's safe to say that the occupants are not happy with you. I'll leave mine for later. I want to take out my jar and examine the fairy inside. Sure. Merrick, you take out the fairy jar from your inventory and find the fey creature inside alive and well, but very annoyed looking. She watches you with narrowed eyes. We better let her out as soon as possible. I would be pissed off too if I were trapped in here. No, Merrick. Uh, leave her. He, if, she, if she has the opportunity to trick you, she could play a prank on you and mess with you somehow, which would not be ideal as we are about to go into a dungeon. At Donna's words, the fairy grows even more angry. She bangs her fists against the glass of the jar and shouts a few choice curses. Yeah, no, I am not doing that. We'll have you out of there in a jiffy, miss. Do I have to do anything in particular to open the jar? I should probably make you roll arcana for this, but I'll be lenient since you're a wizard. 
The fairy's jar is bound with cords. You and Benjen should unwrap the magical cords tied around the lid of the jar. We'll do that. Come, Benjen. Help me unwrap these magical strings and we'll release her from the jar. Okie dokie. We'll get you out in a sec, miss. I hope your hair smells like happiness and bubblegum. Benjen, control yourself. She will curse you if you piss her off. Right, sorry. I will be good. As the strings fall away, the fairy pushes on the lid of the jar. Finally, she is able to free herself and flies out of the small glass prison. She glares between the three members of the party and raises her arms in the air. From her hands falls a sparkling blue powder that catches the light. The glittering dust falls over Merrick and Benjen. In another second, the fairy flies over and pokes Donna in the eye before poofing out of existence in another puff of glitter. I would like all of you to roll 1d10. How dare that fairy poke me in the eye and then disappear, coward. Come back so Donna can poke you back with her magical trident. Chill, Donna, and roll your dice so we can all move on. I rolled a five, Ben. Merrick, you feel something shift in your eyesight. You can't determine exactly what has changed, but you're certain that something is different. Um, is there any way for me to figure out exactly what has happened to me? I'm sure you'll figure it out eventually. That's not funny. Sorry, but I can't think of a way to give you a hint about the blessing without outright breaking the game to tell you. It is a blessing though, right? I haven't been cursed. Ah, uh, that part slipped out. But yes, it is a blessing. What did Benjen roll? Tell me that before we get to Donna. I rolled a 10. Really? A 10? Wow. Okay then. Benjen, you feel something change in your inner ears and a tingle in your brain. But much like Marek, you can't ascertain exactly what has changed. Uh-oh, what does that mean? I guess it's another strange blessing that we won't figure out until later. Be glad that it isn't a curse of some sort. Forget about him. What about me? I rolled a- Donna, you feel yourself somehow getting dumber. You have a permanent one penalty to your intelligence score. What? Apparently irritated at your suggestion to leave her in the jar, the fairy cursed you with a penalty to your intelligence score. Permanently, like, it won't ever go away. Nope. Damn it. What the hell? It's not that bad, Donna. At least intelligence isn't one of your main stats. Oh, that was a sick burn. I wasn't trying to insult her or anything. Hold it. How is this fair? They get some blessings and I get a curse? To be fair, we don't know the full details of our blessings. And about that, I'm going to put you three on mute for a second. Sit tight. All right. So, viewers, here is the list of blessings that I was working from. I will provide a copy of this in the description of the video for those of you listening. If you want to keep the blessings a secret, close your eyes and ears for the next 15 seconds or so. If you notice, the majority of these blessings come with a downside or can easily turn into misfortunes, even if the upsides are incredibly useful. Blessing 5 for Merrick was the passive ability to see invisibility, but some of the things he sees might be fantasies or tricks of the mind. Blessing 10 for Benjen is, funny enough, a passive that keeps speak with animals always active. Long live Benjen the Disney princess. I am so looking forward to using and misusing these new abilities. And uh, we're back. Thank you for waiting patiently, you three. Just wanted to share some background information with the viewers. No worries, they'll tell us whatever you said in the comments. Or we can just watch the video to find out the secret information. I think that's cheating. We shouldn't cheat. We are men of honor. At least the two of us are. Right. One of us is a woman, or playing a woman at least. You caught yourself there. Because my quick wit is unmatched. We can have a debate on that later. Let's go ahead and get started with the episode so that we don't spend the whole episode doing housekeeping matters. That's not very nice to say to Donna, Ben. They can vote now, too. Joe, I'm warning you. Our party opens this episode at the front of the Cliffside Temple. Your new Arakokra friend, Qual, along with several others, helped deliver you to the temple. And you can understand why their wings were necessary. The temple appears to have been carved out of the side of a cliff. And the only way to reach it on foot would be to rock climb up or slide down a rope from topside. I shall wait for you three to exit the temple and bring you back to the outpost. You may count on me. Thank you very much for your assistance. We will make our way through the temple as fast as we can and return topside with haste. And if we don't show up for a day or so, just assume we're dead. It would be dishonorable to leave my post without being dismissed. I shall wait for you all to return. We can make a signal fire or something, Qual. No need to trouble yourself. I said I shall wait at my post until dismissed. If you insist. Now, Benjen, 
Should we play the ritual music at the entrance of the temple right away, or wait until after we finish the temple? Last time we were being chased into the temple, but we have a lot more leeway this time around. I'll go ahead and play. I'll play the beautiful music on my trusty lute. My practice fingers pluck each note out carefully and with gentle love. As the music echoes from your hands, Benjen, it trails along the cliffs and magnifies through the vast canyons. The goddess's melody fills time and space, and you swear the air feels lighter. Not as drastic of an effect as we saw last time. No idea what's going on there, unless I do. No, nothing yet. Never mind that. Let's go on into the dungeon. I can smell the treasure from here. Perhaps I will be gifted another weapon. That would be glorious. Donna, I had a thought. If you keep collecting old and tarnished weapons, you can make yourself an iron throne of swords when you get back to your home tribe. Uh, that is a brilliant idea, Benjamin. I am shocked you are capable of such a suggestion. Hmm. I will keep this idea in mind as we journey. Are you three ready to enter the dungeon? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Or else we'll be stuck here in Donna's daydream and Benjamin's unrelated tangents. The party enters the dungeon, which opens to a long hallway. Several feet ahead, you note the growth of vegetation overtaking the corridor of stone. It is dark, but Merrick, thanks to your fey ancestry, you can see further ahead than the other two in the party. All you note, however, is more vegetation. There appears to be a branching hallway ahead, which veers to the left. Can you see anything ahead, Merrick? There is a left turn we can take. Everything appears to be overgrown with moss and leaves and the like. I don't see much of anything else. I'll take a tentative step forward. Did you forget what happened in the first temple when Donna charged ahead? What is your question, Merrick? Of course he forgot. Either way, nothing happens as Benjamin steps onto the foliage. Oh, right then. I will note for you three that the thick vines and overgrowth makes navigation more difficult. If you have to run through this terrain, you will be slowed down. As we approach that left turn, can I see anything else? Further in the hall, you can see two more branching paths, both to the right. Merrick, you also note that the vegetation dies off down the hall, but from where you are standing, you think you can hear something echoing from the end of the hall. Roll perception to see what you can hear. I rolled a 13, how is that? From the end of the hall, you hear the swishing of water in a cavern, as well as a sinister laugh that sounds eerily familiar. The smell of stagnant water drifts down the hall. Roll perception again for me to see what else you can hear. Uh, critical failure. Can one of the others roll it? What about Benjen? That fairy spell did something to his ears, didn't it? I rolled a 23 for perception. Wow. All right. Benjen, you strain your ears to try to hear what Merrick is interested in, and you recognize the laugh of a hag. Sounds like a hag. We do not want to go down there. Let's choose one of the other halls. How about the very first one? Sure, sounds good to me. You return to the very first branching hallway you encountered, which feeds into a split pathway. Ahead of the party, you see the statue of a woman in a small alcove. The branching hallway feeds to a pair of staircases in each direction. The stonework of the dungeon gives way to a tile floor around the statue, and there are magical barriers across each staircase, blocking your path. Smells like a puzzle. Maybe we need to do something with that statue. Tell me more about it, Ben. I shall investigate like Scooby-Doo. The ground around the statue is finished with green tiles. The statue itself is a likeness of a goddess with long hair. Behind her is a mural, a painting of the moon which glows around her head like a halo. She is my angel. I must pray to her. No, Benjamin. Wait. Let's investigate a bit more. What about these tiles around the statue? It is my turn to do something, so I will investigate them with my huge brain. Your huge brain, which just got nerfed by a fairy. So sit back down. There are eight green tiles in a three-by-three three grid. One of the tiles is missing. What do you mean, missing? As you examine the floor, Donna, you note that it looks like the missing tile was pried up from the ground by force. There are nail marks against the stone and scuffs around neighboring tiles. Shit, looks like someone deliberately messed with this puzzle. What do we do now? There must be something valuable hidden behind this puzzle, but I'm not sure if we can get to it just yet. Maybe we need to investigate the dungeon more to find the missing tile. Wait, nail marks like from the hag Benjen heard? Oh, oh dear, do we have to? Maybe she'll be a waifu. Donna can try her flirt attack on her. We don't even know if the hag is the one who messed with the tile. It could be something else. 
It's the closest lead we have, literally, since it's down the hall. All right. But let's be smart about this. I have an invisibility potion in my inventory. Why don't I move ahead to see if the hag has what we're looking for? And if she does, you'll have to steal it somehow. Can you be sneaky and get it without getting caught? Hmm. I can always use Misty Step for a getaway to get back to the two of you. Actually, of the three of us, I believe I have the best sneaking skills. Shut up, Benj, and let the grown-ups come up with the plan. No, he's right. He can't use Misty Step, but he has better stealth and sleight of hand skills and would have a better chance of grabbing the tile without anyone noticing. I could let him use an invisibility potion, too. If you're using the invisibility potion, then it doesn't matter which of us goes. In fact, it should be me, since I have the most health of us all. I can take a hit. If either of you are noticed and get attacked, you will die. What if each of you roll 1d6 and the person who rolls the highest can go? I rolled a one. Me too. No way, so did I. The odds of that happening are astronomical. Okay, roll again. Two this time. Me too. What the hell is going on with these dice? Did you rig them, Benjamin? Hey, hey, I got a four this time. Looks like I'll be the one sneaking in to get the tile. I'll give Benjamin one of my invisibility potions. It lasts 10 minutes, so you have time. But don't take too long. No worries, guys. I can do this. We'll stick close by in the hallway in case something goes wrong. The party returns to the hallway overgrown in vegetation and moss. You notice, as you pass through again, toadstools have sprouted in the corners of the hallway. The spots on the mushrooms almost feel as if they are following your every move. Don't I detect anything unusual? No, not so far. But you just said... But what about me? I have danger sense. And you do not detect any danger in the area. Huh? Really? Because those toadstools you just added uh, sure are suspicious. If we pass through here again, Merrick, and there are more toadstools, I want you to blast the hallway with fire. Agreed. Let's check for this tile first, though. I'll make sure I'm crouched out of view at the opening to the room with the hag. I want to be safely out of the way, but close enough that we can aid Benjan should he need it. I'll do that, too, and I have my trident ready to strike. I will drink down the invisibility potion and sneak into the room. Does the hag notice me? No. Benjen, you are able to enter the room unnoticed. Upon entry, you note that the room has taken on the characteristics of a swamp more than a dungeon room. There are deep puddles of bog water on the floor, with foliage growing through the stone and breaking the walls. Inside the room is indeed a hag, and she appears to be caring for some of the plants growing in the room. She has not noticed you. I want to search the area to see if I can find the tile. Roll investigation. Uh, okay, I got a five. God damn it, we are dead. Time to attack. Just hold on, Donna. Benjen, you can't discern exactly where the hag might have the tile, if she has taken it at all. We've got to come up with an alternate plan while Benjen still has the advantage of invisibility. I'm very tempted to deafen Benjen while you two come up with an alternate plan. Please don't, Ben. I wonder if I could send in Poe to distract the hag, or Benjen could distract the hag while Poe pokes around a bit but I'm not keen on sending my familiar into a room where he might be attacked. Ah, this is a swamp. I will send out Prince Hops to search. That uh, is actually another good idea, Benjamin. Did you remember to take your pills, Joe? Hunter gave me a new type of pill to try and it is charging up my brain blasts. A frog in a swamp is perfectly ordinary. Out of the two familiars, he would have a better chance searching the room. I shall send out Prince Hops from my little cage pendant. Go Pokeball. Keep as quiet as possible, Benjen. You're going to ruin your invisibility. I will cast... Wait a moment, Benjen. As Prince Hops exits the cage pendant and lands on the floor, he looks around with a surprised blink. What an odd sort of place to find oneself in a strange welcome for a member of royalty. Mavana gave that frog to Benjen, right? I guess he's more special than she let on. Merrick and Donna, all you can hear is a ribbit from the frog. No, we just heard him talk. Benjen heard that. But you two only heard a soft ribbit as Prince Hops flopped onto the mud. Merrick, we've got to abandon Benjen here. He's on drugs. He's hearing things now. Shut it, Donna. It's more likely the blessing from that fairy. I know, I know. But I still think we should leave him. Prince Hops looks about the swampy room with discontent. I will whisper so softly and... If... 
Prince Hops, do not despair. I need your help. We must find a tile somewhere hidden in this room. It is green, just like you. Very good. Very good, Bellman. Be at ease while I search the room for this tile. Let me do a roll for Prince Hops. Ah, very good. Prince Hops splashes about the swamp until one of his well-placed hops lands on a bit of solid ground under the stagnant, dirty water. He looks under his feet and exclaims, Jolly good, Bellman. I found something stuck in the mud. I believe it is the tile you seek. But can Benjen get the tile and get out of the room without being noticed? Make a sleight of hand roll, Benjen. I rolled a 15. And make a stealth roll while you're at it. And an 11. Benjen, you are able to carefully wiggle out the tile from the muddy water, and you tiptoe your way out of the room. You almost catch the eye of the hag, who is still tending her plants, but are able to reach the doorway. Prince Hops follows behind. Well done, Bellman. Get us out of this filthy place as soon as possible. I swear I have never seen such dirty water. Not at all worthy of royalty. Benjen, with the tile in hand and Prince Hops in tow, makes it out of the hag's dungeon swamp and back safely in the hall with Merrick and Donna. That went very well. Nicely done, Benjen. Now we can put that tile back in place and see what treasure awaits. I say, Bellman, these two are ordering you around. Do not forget that you are first and foremost my servant. I like the frog. He verbally abuses Benjen. Donna, you have no idea what Prince Hops is saying. All you can hear are ribbits. I didn't know I had a royal frog familiar. I am most honored. Look, Marak, Benjen has gone mad. He thinks he can talk to his frog without using any spells. Why are you surprised, Bellman? It was you who bestowed me with this title. A bellman can't make someone into a prince. It doesn't work like that. Let the frog live in delusion, Merrick. I like him talking down to Benjen. Such a dignified frog. Oh, I love him so. Let's make our way back to the tile and statue puzzle before we chat more. I'm waiting for that hag to chase us out into the hallway. The party backtracks through the overgrown hallway. More toadstools peek out from between the stones, their spots following the path of the party. You remember our deal, Merrick? It was less of a deal and more of an agreement. Stand back, Benjen. I'm going to burn away some of this growth. I'll cast Burning Hands as a first-level spell to ignite the vegetation. The fire licks at the surrounding hallway, eating away at the leaves, vines, and shriveling up the toadstools. The foliage burns slowly, evidently damp from the dungeon air, but it does burn away eventually, clearing the path ahead. I should pick some of those baked mushrooms for the goddess. I can use them as an offering. While you're at it, give her some of those special pills you're taking. I bet she'd love those. I think she'd prefer some candies. Can we get back to the point? Exactly. The party returns to the tile puzzle and statue room. What would you like to do? Obviously, we're going to slot the tile back in place, and I'll stomp on it for good measure. As you smush the tile back into its slot, a glow gleams from the floor all around the statue, and the magical wards that had been blocking the stairs fade away. And now we're free to go up the stairs. My prince, you should come back to the pendant so that you're nice and safe. That is a superb idea. I shall be at your disposal at your convenience, Bellman. The party continues up the stairs, noting that the air begins to grow heavy as you ascend. You hear crackling electricity and the buzz of magic thick in the corridor. As you turn the corner, you see the source of the magic and electricity, a storm harpy who is guarding the room. She sits atop a large treasure chest, preening her feathers, but stops as the party enters. Defeat me for both treasure and a healing blessing, she says, before flapping her wings. Rather than lifting to the sky, electric magic sparks from her feathers and dances around her fingertips. Let's all roll initiative. I rolled a 19. Dirty 20 for me. Ah, some good old-fashioned dungeon diving. How I've missed this. I rolled a 14. The monster rolled a 12, so the initiative order will go Donna, Marek, Benjen, and then the Harpy. Donna, you're up. I'm going to charge ahead and attack with my trident. Eight and unnatural 20 to hit. Only the 20 will hit. Roll for damage and tell me how it goes down. Uh, that's, uh, nine piercing damage and five radiant damage. Despite the overgrown chicken dodging Donna's first attack, she does not lose heart. She jabs once again in a determined attack, and then I will end my turn making sure the two squishy gents are shielded by Donna's awesome might. My turn then. 
I'm gonna run and hide behind one of those pillars and then cast Ray of Frost as a cantrip. 11 to hit. Is that good enough? No, not quite. Your magic slides off the feathers of the harpy. Benjen, it's your turn. I will attack with my dagger by throwing it. 10 to hit. That probably misses, huh? Yeah. Sorry, Joe. At least your dagger flies right back to your hand after thrown. I will also hide behind a pillar like Merrick, and I will use bardic inspiration on Donna. Go, Donna. You're our girl. Damn right. About time you praised my godliness. It is now the Harpy's turn. The Storm Harpy casts Thunderwave on Donna. Donna, I need you to make a constitution saving throw. Not a problem. I rolled a 24. Despite the force of the spell, Donna, you are able to stay on your feet, but you take two points of thunder damage. It is a scratch. Ha! Is that all she's got? Not quite. Angry that the spell did not push Donna back, the Storm Harpy swipes at her with a long sword she kept sheathed at her side. The sword itself also crackles with electrical magic. Donna, make a deck saving throw. I rolled an eight. Donna, thanks to your upgraded armor class, the sword does not deal any slashing damage to you, but lightning magic from the metal blade shoots out and hits you. Seven points of lightning damage. Still just a scratch. I will pay her back for the damage. My turn, I will rage. Fury ripples through my muscles. Chicken dinner again, boys. Then I will attack with my trident, 19 and 17 to hit. Those both hit. First hit does 16 damage and second attack does 21 damage. Donna, rage. Holy shit, that's 37 damage in one turn. Donna is amazing. Go Donna, she's our girl, the warrior princess. Finally, you two are seeing things my way. That attack does some devastating damage, Donna. Tell us how it goes down. Enraged that this overgrown chicken has dared scratch me, I raise my weapon in a battle cry before skewering the monster. Marek, you're up, beat that. Unfortunately, all my powerful spells cause AOE damage that will hit you as well. I'll have to keep that in mind and adjust my spells when I can. I'll move out and cast Ray of Frost again, 25 to hit and nine damage. As Donna would say, that is peanuts. But I don't want to hit Donna with a spell. Content to have Donna in the limelight finally about time. After casting my spell, I want to take cover behind the pillar again. With the blast of cold magic, the harpy staggers and then regains her footing. She is looking quite fatigued already from the fight. Benjen, you're up. Okie doke. Donna, did you use up that bardic inspiration? Not yet. Got it. Okie, I will cast Vicious Mockery on the Harpy. The Wisdom save is 14. The Harpy rolled an 11. Roll for damage, Benjen. Right. Miss Harpy, your mother was a hamster and your father smelled of elderberries. That's, that's six points of psychic damage. The insult provokes a snarl from the Storm Harpy, who brandishes her longsword. She casts Thunder Wave. Donna, make another constitution saving throw. 22. Try as you might, Harpy Lady, but you won't hit me. The spell slides off Donna due to her strong constitution, but she does take three points of thunder damage. Still, the Harpy Lady hasn't given up. She swings her longsword again, which is a hit. Donna, make another deck saving throw to see if you can at least dodge the additional lightning damage that follows her swing. On it, I rolled a 13. Is that enough? Just barely. Donna, the monster's sword slashes at you, dealing 12 damage, but you manage to wiggle out of the way of the additional lightning blast, which could have been devastating. Still but a scratch, and I will finish this fight quickly. 22 and 10 to hit. If you haven't used Benjen's Bardic Inspiration yet, you can do so. A warning though, you'll have to roll a six for that second one to hit. No problem. Hmm? I got a three, fine, whatever. I'll only get to hit once. Nine piercing damage and an additional six radiant damage. Then I'm up again. I'm guessing this monster has resistance to lightning damage, right? Next time we level up, remind me to add some spells that I can use without damaging allies in the area. All right, I'll use Ray of Frost again. 19 to hit and seven damage. Still peanuts compared to me, Merrick. Shut it, Donna. I'm trying to be considerate to you. I could throw a fireball, but it would hit you as well. You couldn't hit me even if you tried. No one can touch Donna. Is it my turn? I'll cast Hideous Laughter as a first level spell. Wisdom save is 14. It's all shits and giggles until someone giggles and shits. Was that the joke? Yeah, how was it? 
three out of five. You've done better. But the joke hits, knocking the storm harpy prone and laughing uncontrollably. With that, it's the harpy's turn. But the harpy is still laughing at Benyon's joke and is laying prone. Donna, you're up. I get an automatic critical hit since the harpy is prone, right? Since you're within five feet of the creature, yes. Oh yes, this will be delicious. I will attack with my trident. The automatic crit plus rage means I deal 44 damage total. That will kill the storm harpy. How does it go down, Donna? With a battle cry, I slash and poke at the harpy with my magnificent trident. My golden hair flows with my movements, matching all of my beautiful golden bangles and bracers. Yes. As the harpy falls, a gentle light twinkles into the room from above, restoring your health. This is evidently a healing room, much like the room you found in the previous dungeon. Donna was the only one hurt in that last battle, but the healing is appreciated all the same. We can return to this room if we need a top-up. I, I gotta admit, Benjamin, I think we found a good plan of attack. When you use hideous laughter, I can get those sweet crits in. You found your true purpose as a support for Donna. He's a support for the whole team, but I agree that that strategy is effective. I will keep that in mind. Ben, did we confirm that Benjamin's blessing has to do with speaking to animals? I'll throw you a bone here. Benjamin's blessing allows him to speak with animals without expending a spell slot. It's always active. A true Disney princess. Of all the blessings I thought up, he had to get that one. Funny how it turned out. Before I forget, Benjamin, you should change your spells up now that we know the fairy blessing gave you the ability to talk to animals. You don't need your speak with animal spell anymore and can replace it with something else. Oh, that's right. Hum, there are so many choices and I'm not sure what to pick. Let me have a look. So, I know you mentioned an episode or so ago wanting more combat spells, but it would help us in a lot of future encounters if you have the spell silence set up. That will help us control enemies better, especially when we get in fights with multiple spellcasters. Okay, I'll add silence as a prepared spell. Now let us check out the treasure. What did we get? Inside the treasure, you find a number of items. First, a pile of 300 gold. You also find a sapphire ring and gold amulet. Lastly, you find a mysterious green crystal that glows the same green as the tiles you found before the goddess statue. The same green, huh? I'd wager that crystal is relevant to a puzzle somewhere in the dungeon. I don't care about that. Look at all that gold. Save your greed for after the dungeon, Donna. We'll divide up the treasure when we're finished. Sounds good to me. We've got to find the music room for the last piece of the ritual song. There are two more hallways to go down, though one is closer than the other. And the other means we have to get close to the swampy room with the hag. I'd rather not go there if we can help it. Agreed. We'll go down the closer hallway and see where that takes us. All right. The party returns to the statue and tile puzzle, continuing back down the main hallway that Merrick cleared away with fire. Scorch marks cover the floor where vines and foliage were burned. The party turns down the corridor to the right, finding more leaves growing out of the stone. I can burn this section away as well with a quick spell. As you raise your hands to cast the spell, Merrick, your ankles are grabbed. You look down to see the form of a little girl peeking out of a mushroom, her torso rising out of the shadow of the mushroom like a strange specter. You recognize these creatures as the same ones you encountered in the pocket of Feywild of Mem's creation, Myconets. More of them rise out of the floor and shadows of the mushrooms, grappling the members of the party. They whisper amongst each other, passing words from one to the other and down the hall. It is as if they are softly calling something. I ready my trident for an attack. And I have my spells ready. Oh, the little girls are so cute. From the shadows comes a red-headed young lady with equally red eyes. Fold them in place. We must not let them pass. I will ensure this is over quickly. She produces a pair of sickles, one for each hand, and lunges towards the party. With your marching order, Donna is the closest to the enemy. Can I try to jump out of the way of the attack? You can try, but since you're grappled by the Myconets, you'll roll with disadvantage. I'll let you do a strength save to see if you can retch your legs free. Don't care, don't matter. Roll to 16 and 25. That's good enough. Donna, you are able to shake off the grasp of the Myconets in time to evade the monster girl's attack with sickles. And I am going to use my flirtation attack against this lady. Watch this, boys. 
You don't have a flirtation attack, but I will allow you to try and de-escalate the situation. If that means you're going to try to flirt with the monster, then go ahead. It's a monster, not just a girl? Well... I rolled an 18 on the persuasion check. Seriously? That high? All right, what are you going to say? Lovely maiden, let us not fight. We can talk this over to resolve it, surely. Tell me, what is your name? A woman of such beauty and grace should not exert herself so. The monster girl considers Donna's words for a moment. Can I roll insight to ascertain whether Donna is helping at all? Sure. I rolled a 13. The monster girl looks conflicted. You can see that she is considering Donna's words. That's a good start. Let me use my silver tongue, a bard's greatest strength. All right, Benjen, roll persuasion. Yeah, in 22, I will back up Donna. Come, miss, there is no need to fight. Let us settle this peacefully like civilized people. The monster girl lowers her pair of sickles. Her eyes flick to each member of the party. Benjen and Merrick, you're still being held down by Mykonets, so keep that in mind. Let's start with a name, perhaps. What is your name, miss? This one is called Carmine. Carmine, what a beautiful name to match your lovely red hair. We do not wish to fight lovely Carmine. We are simply traversing this dungeon. Please let us pass peacefully. I was ordered not to let you pass. I must follow my orders. You could think of it not as letting us pass, but as, uh, we accidentally slipped by while you weren't looking. Perhaps you can move down the hall and peek into that swampy room, just for a few moments, if you catch my meaning. Merrick, roll persuasion. I rolled an 18. Wow. The woman seriously considers your words. Perhaps, but first we must deal with the Myconets. They like to tattle. She raises her sickle, and in the blink of an eye, raises a patch of mushrooms from the dungeon floor. I will assist you in this. Destroy the remaining mushrooms. Not a problem. I can do that quickly with some fire, just like before. The Mykonets holding down Benjen and Donna twist their arms around them, enraged at the turn of Carmine. Burn them away. I will free you. She uses her sickles again to raise more of the mushrooms, specifically those umbrellaed over the Mykonets. Do it now, quickly. As she speaks, more mushrooms pop out from the dungeon floors. All right. I'll use burning hands to set fire to the vegetation here. Good. Burn it all away. As she speaks, Benjen, you note a twinge of regret in her expression. Is everything all right, Miss Carmine? I was looking forward to watching you bleed. Oh, ah. Uh... She's not some kind of vampire, is she? Oh, I can use True Strike to gain insight into her defenses. Just as a warning, Benjen. I'm going to make you roll a stealth check. If you fail it while casting that spell, you'll provoke more combat. Then I will not fail. I will pray to the goddess for luck, and she will smile upon me. Natural 20. You are lying. I wish he was, but I watched him do the roll. This is getting ridiculous. Our writer is considering praying to the goddess too. Damn. Well then, Benjen, you are able to cast the spell without Carmine noticing. She is not undead. She is a fey creature of note, one that has an affinity and lust for blood. What? Fey creatures should be cute little fairies and other wonderful beings, not a bloodthirsty. And one that Donald once called an ugly old man looking thing. A, a red cap, she's in league with Mem. Well, obviously, you didn't figure that out from all the mushrooms and the myconets. Shut up, Merrick. At least I handled the situation so that we don't have to fight. I will give you some props for that. Anyway, I cast Burning Hands to set fire to the foliage growing through the hallway. The fire burns away the mushrooms as well, returning the corridor to bare stone and dirt, but with scorch marks lining the walls. Carmine looks back at the party, still holding her sickles. She still appears conflicted. Miss Carmine, Mem won't hurt you or do something bad because you let us go. I'd like to hear more about your relationship with Mem, if you wouldn't mind sharing. She's a bit of an enigma to our party. I cannot share much about her. I'm bound to silence by magic, but know this, she will come for you. And when she does you, and when she finally ensnares you, then I'll have to make you bleed. 
She walks further down the hallway, back to the intersection you left behind. Let's quickly move to the next room before she comes back. I think she's... A few plums short of a fruit pie. We don't talk about sexuality like that, Benjamin. How dare you? I believe he was speaking more to her soundness of mind. Anyway, let's keep moving. The party enters an extremely large room, which seems to lack any real walls. The ceiling is supported by columns, or perhaps by magic, but from the edges of the room, you can see a dark abyss swirling around, as if the dungeon room were floating in a sea of darkness. The room is decorated with a series of nine statues, each in the shape of an angel covering their eyes. Ah, weeping angels, don't blink. What? Weeping angels from Doctor Who. Doctor Who, who? That's what I said. It's a British television show, Donald. Surprised that Ben used these as a reference. Nah, I'm just kidding. A commenter made a suggestion to include them in an episode. What the hell, Ben? Screw you and screw that commenter. Besides, we are American presidents. How unpatriotic of you. Well, I've also used a lot of references to anime and such. And that's all from Japan. So they're not dangerous? They're just statues? Yeah, just statues. Okay, because I wanted to have a moment to stop and talk about Mem. What do you two make of her? She started off being helpful to us on this journey, but as we've gone on, she's gotten more and more suspicious. She mentioned being taken from her home as a young girl and sort of forced into her current position as a messenger for the goddess of harmony. I've also been thinking since the last episode, do you think it's a coincidence that our trip in the pocket of Feywild messed with time? I'm not convinced it was all an accident. I get what you're saying, but it doesn't make sense. Why should she start out helping us and then start to mess with us? I'm more inclined to believe that the Feywild trip was an accident. So then why is she clearly interfering with our exploration of this dungeon? Everything we've encountered thus far is some kind of Fey creature or points back to a tie to Mem. It really doesn't make sense. Have you guys noticed that the past two dungeons have had monsters and traps that relate to their surroundings? In the Rainforest Temple, we fought monkeys and jaguars and other monster creatures that would belong in a rainforest. In the beach temple, we dealt with water-related puzzles. I was expecting this temple to be more air-related. There was the storm harpy. That's air and sky related. True, but the hag mushrooms and carmine are very out of place. Maybe Mem had them stick around in here to slow us down. Maybe even kill us. But why? Why bother helping us at the start of our journey if she's trying to hinder us now? Huh, I see. Mem understands what is required for malicious compliance. What do you mean? Like maybe she has to act a certain way against her wishes. So she finds way to undermine the orders or subtly work against them. That would make a lot of sense. How'd you come up with that so fast? Oh, I've seen it all the time from employees. Right. In any case, it's more for us to think about. We should be careful around her in the future. I don't think we can fully trust her. In the very least, her motives are unclear. Until we fully understand them, we should stay vigilant. Right. Donna will protect you two with her fearsome might. And you'll have my brain to help keep us all safe. Uh, what about me? What do I have? Uh, you've got spirit, I guess. I feel so touched seeing you all work as a team. Shall we continue the dungeon exploration? Yeah, go ahead, Ben. Too much of this goody nonsense will give me indigestion. As I mentioned, the room you all have entered is vast. There are nine of the statues I mentioned, split into groups of three. The statues are numbered counterclockwise, with the first one in the northeastern corner of the room. On the northern wall are statues one, two, and three. On the western wall are statues four, five, and six. On the southern wall are statues seven, eight, and nine. As you approach each statue, you notice that they feature a plaque beneath them with script. The top line of each plaque reads the same thing. Who was the last one to hold the gem? But below that, on each plaque, is a different script. One, someone stole the gem from me after I stole it from six. Two, I suspect eight stole from me. Three, I was the first to have the gem. I wanted it to myself. Four, seven is jealous of six, but six stole from seven. Five, eight gave the gem to four to hide it. Six, I saw five steal the gem from one. Serves them right. Seven, I stole the gem from nine. Eight, I suspect two stole the gem from five. Nine, I stole the gem from three. 
What gem are they talking about? You note that the statues have a slot where you can insert a gem into their torso. The slot looks to be the same size as the gem you found after fighting the Storm Harpy. Uh-huh. So that gem was important for a puzzle after all. Let me sit and think about this puzzle. Let me have a try. Benjen, will all of my love and respect, we are trying to get out of the dungeon in one piece. I fear that if you take charge of this riddle, that will no longer be possible. Let the wizard use his brain. That's what he's here for. You're here for the music. I think I've worked it out. I believe four is the last to hold the gem. I'll insert it into the statue's torso. As the gem slides into place, the statue seems to come alive. She reaches for the gem in her heart and lifts it in her hand, glancing at it lovingly. The statue once again freezes solid when she is holding the gemstone in her hand. You hear a creaking sound and stone sliding against stone. Near the southeastern corner of the room, a passageway opens, and you also note a treasure chest waiting for the party. Dang. That's two fights you guys have gotten around in this dungeon, and I worked so hard to add some interesting enemies for this episode. Well, that's how it goes, I suppose. Merrick, you do note the presence of three ghostly figures near some of the statues, but as you solve the puzzle, they make no movements or motions to attack. Do you guys see those figures? Donna and Benjen don't see them. I don't see anything. Maybe it's a trick of the light or the result of me solving the puzzle. Huh. They aren't attacking? No. In fact, now that you take a second look, they seem to have disappeared. Weird. Could I tell if they were friends or enemies? No way of knowing with such a quick glance. Anyway, you guys have gotten around another obstacle. Nicely done. Can't say I'm a bit disappointed at how this dungeon is turning out. Quit your whining and tell me about the treasure, Ben. Inside the treasure chest are nine vials of liquid in assorted colors. What? More potions? Boo! That stinks. Considering we didn't have to fight to get them, I'd say it's a fair deal. I'll collect those with the other treasure that we can go through later. Solving the puzzle with the statues opened up another room, which is dimly lit. Within, you can see the form of a monster slumbering near broken pillars, guarding another treasure, which is situated on top of a large stone altar. Benjen, you can make out sheet music carved upon this altar. Then this must be the music room. And that's the final boss. All right, I'm ready. Upon the entrance of the party, the monster stands and stretches, and you can see the form of a lion with a swirling mane. His fur sparkles and crackles with electricity, not unlike the storm harpy. He steps forward into view. His mane is not made of fur, but of storm clouds. He bows to the party and then lets out a roar. Roll initiative. How polite for a final boss. I rolled a two. Ha! Skill issue! I rolled a... Wait, I rolled a two. You were saying? I rolled a seven. Merrick and Donna, roll again for your initiative. Nine this time. I rolled a 17. Did you both roll a one the first time without your bonus? Yep, this episode's luck has been abysmal. I'm so tempted to make you lose a turn just for that one, but I won't be that mean. All right. The monster rolled a five. The initiative order will go Donna, Merrick, Benjen, and then the monster. Let's do this. Just like it should be, Donna's up first. Can you not just run up and go to close combat right off the bat? I'd like to get in a good fireball. And I can't do it if you're so close to the monster. Tough shit. Deal with it. Donna does what she wants. I'm going to run up to the monster enraged and used by beautiful Trident. Light of the sea. Destroy this kitty. 21 and 8 to hit. The 21 hits. That's 6 piercing damage and 9 radiant damage. Benjen, as Donna makes your attack, you hear a rumbling laugh from the beast. An excellent swing. These are worthy fighters. Can I try to persuade the kitty to let us pass without fighting? You can try, I suppose. But combat has already started. I'm going to make you roll with disadvantage. Roll persuasion. Seven and 15. I have to take the seven, though. Darn. Um, Mr. Kitty, let's not fight, okay? Apologies, but I must test your worth for the goddess before letting you pass. Let us see how well you fight. Onward. It is Merrick's turn. I didn't get to narrate my actions. Oh, right. Go ahead. I swing my trident in a mighty arc. The lion is in awe of my strength. He's not quite in awe yet. We'll see how this plays out. My turn. I'm going to cast Fireball as a third level spell. 
What, really? Donna has a lesson to learn. Merrick, you have to say it like this. As Prince Zuko, I mean Princess Donna, kneels before you, your voice comes out in a powerful growl. You say, you will learn respect and suffering will be your teacher. I don't know what you're referencing, Benjen, but sure. Donna will learn respect and suffering will be her teacher. Fireball, third level spell, right at the monster. Donna, make a deck saving throw for me. What? You need to dodge Merrick's fireball spell. I get advantage though, right? With danger sense. Yeah, go ahead and roll. Damn it, I rolled a five and eight. And the monster rolled a 17. So it dodges the attack, but Donna doesn't. Donna is gonna take 29 points of fire damage. Holy shit, Merrick, you asshole. I can't believe you would do this. I kind of thought you'd be able to dodge with danger sense. My B. That's all you have to say, my B? Wait, Donna, um, why not use your tail in a reaction? You have your beast form active in a rage. Well, I, that's supposed to be for attack rolls, not a saving throw. But good try, Benjen. Sorry, Donna, I will try to heal you soon. The monster watches you all fight with disappointment. Nint, perhaps you are not as worthy as I thought. We are worth, Mr. Kitty, we will show you. It is my turn, and I will throw Donna one of my red berry items, which will allow her to heal 2d8. Can she go ahead and eat those during my turn? It's your turn, not hers. I will run over and shove the berries in Donna's mouth. I will save you, Donna. Uh... I'll allow that. Banjen, you are now in melee combat of the beast, though. The berry heals Donna for six health points. Um, then I will cast Hideous Laughter on the beast as a first level spell. It's a success. The joke I tell is, um, uh, why don't you play games with cats? They tend to be cheetahs. Six out of 10. But the lion monster finds the joke hilarious and falls prone, laughing. It laughs so hard that it is unable to make a move this turn, and we will return to the top of the round with Donna. I'm gonna stab Merrick with my trident. No, Donna, we must not fight. He started it! We can settle that after defeating this beast. Look, I have set up our killer combo. The lion is laughing, ready for a crit. Uh, hmm. True, all right, I'll attack twice with my trident. Sweet, sweet crit time. 44 damage, die, kitty. Still enraged and now further powered by the betrayal of Merrick, I fuel my swing with the rippling hatred and raw power. The attack is devastating, but the lion is still healthy enough to fight. Merrick, we're back to your turn. Right. Well, now Benjen's next to the lion as well, so I don't think I'll throw another fireball. What the hell, Merrick? I, don't you care about us? You might have thought more about teamwork and how I could use more of my spells, if you didn't simply run up and attack the monsters at close range every time. Or you could have stepped back at the end of your turn to leave me an opening. We're entering Merrick's villain arc. I can feel it. Anyway, I'll cast Ray of Frost and I rolled a 17 to hit. That hits. And it deals six cold damage. I'll also run to take cover behind one of the pillars to shield myself from attack. See, Donna? That's how it's done. Whatever. Let me play how I want to play. Guys, let's not fight. It's my turn. Um, do you guys think this lion has lightning spells? Safe to assume so. Then I will cast silence around the lion. Now I must concentrate on the spell. Also, I will use bardic inspiration on Donna, but I will do that first, before the silence, unless she wants to see my groovy dance moves for inspiration. Black, no thanks. That will mean it is the lion's turn. Inside of the Orb of Silence, the lion is unable to cast spells. Instead, he goes for Benjen with his teeth and claws. Benjen, please make a deck saving throw. 21. You are able to evade the monster's attack enough to keep concentrating on your spell, but you feel a sting of pain as the monster's claws make contact, dealing 11 points of slashing damage. Not good, but I am concentrating. The lion also jumps outside of the radius of the spell. Shit. Well, that was useless. Not necessarily. Benjen's spell could have blocked the monster from making a magic-based attack that turn. Donna, you have no idea what Merrick is saying because you are deafened inside of the Ball of Silence. It is your turn. Right. No idea what Merrick is going on about. 
but I'm going to keep attacking this cat. I will move over and attack with my trident again. 11 and 25 to hit. One of those hits. For 13 damage, nine piercing, and three radiant. I swing and poke at the lion beast in another savage attack before retreating back a bit. How's that for team play, Homeric? Huh, at least you're learning. Donna and Benjen are a safe distance away from the lion, right? Yes. They are far enough away that they shouldn't get hit by any of your spells aimed at the lion. Then I'll cast Fireball again as a third level spell. And it hits. Then that's going to be 36 points of fire damage. And I'll take cover once again behind a one of the pillars. With Merrick's fire spell, the monster is now looking very wounded, but it's not over yet. Benjen, you're up. Okay, I'll break my concentration on silence and I will recast it at the lion. No thunder and lightning spells for you today, Mr. Big Whiskers. Donna, did you use up that bardic inspiration? Not yet. In that case, I'll use bardic inspiration on Merrick. That's my last one. Use it well. Will do. Let's see if your excellent command of the battlefield will work in our favor. Inside the ball of silence, the lion snarls and lunges for Donna, using his teeth and claws again. Only one of his swipes manages to make contact, Donna, but it deals 16 points of slashing damage. Not good. I'm getting low health, guys. How's the monster looking? He's very wounded and visibly wobbly on his legs. We must be close to defeating it. Let's try to push through. Right, I'll follow the same pattern as before. I will run up to attack twice with my trident. 20 and 23 to hit. Both hit. Then that's 26 piercing damage and 12 radiant damage. Wait, that's 38 total damage in one attack? Uh, yeah, looks like. Then that's going to finish off the monster. Wow, maybe the goddess made a mistake giving Donna that weapon. W what? No way! With Donna's final blow, the lion beast purrs with pride and bows to the party. I am satisfied. You may cure, you may pass. His mane billows outward, shrouding him in cloud, and once the mist clears, he is gone. Bye, buddy. Hope you find your dad. That reference is now out of season, Joe. Anyway, good work, guys. I will punch Merrick in the face. 18 to hit and four bludgeoning damage. Uh, all right. What was that for? You know what it was for. You almost killed Donna. But I didn't. What if you had? I thought your motto was, if we die, we die. Yeah, but not at the hands of a party member. Are you kidding me, Merrick? All right, all right, I'm sorry. I didn't think it would do that much damage, and I really thought you'd be able to dodge it. Huh? This room is the music room, isn't it, Ben? Indeed it is. Under the chest that the lion was guarding, you see sheet music carved into the great stone tablet. Benjen, go ahead and copy that down while Donna and I look through the loot to see what we got. We didn't find that much treasure in this dungeon, but at least we didn't have to fight as much as usual. While Benjen copies the notes, Merrick, you and Donna open the treasure chest. Inside, you find two spell scrolls, 500 gold, a chain shirt, and a crossbow. This treasure seems a lot more pointedly organized than what we found before. All the same, I vote we collect it, add it to the pile, and divvy it up once we get back to the Aracocra outpost and have a long rest. Yeah, someone is in need of healing soon. One long rest and you'll be good as new. Benjen, are you done copying the music? Sure am. So now we just need to find the magic circle that will transport us out of here. After opening the chest, a concealed door on the southern wall clicked open, and inside you can see the familiar glow of a magic circle. Found it. Now let's blow this joint so we can count the golden treasure. Back at the entrance of the temple, the party finds Quail and the other flyers standing at the ready. It seems he was serious about waiting at his post no matter what. He straightens at the sight of the party. Finished already? Excellent, excellent. We will be able to make it back to the village in time for a good supper, I think. Ah, that sounds so lovely. Good food and a good nap. I can feel my eyes drooping already. If you'll all hang on tight... We'll have you back at the outpost quickly. We found so much gold in that temple. I'll have to find another blacksmith soon to add to Donna's immaculate drip. Speaking of, I think that chain shirt we found is for Benjen. Good thing, too. Donna can't call us both squishy gents anymore. Yeah, now that only applies to you, Merrick. Either way, it'll be good to update our stats a bit more. Ben, do you think we'll level up soon? It's been a while. 
Yes, I was just thinking about that. We can do that when you get back for the long rest. We will have to wait to go through the treasure next episode, however, because when you land with Quell, you note the form of a familiar person waiting for you near the outpost. Her fiery orange hair is unmistakable. She stands, magic swirling around her figure in silent fury. Mem waits for you, ready to fight.